name is Michaela Krutzkamp. I am a student in the Department of Communications. I would like to welcome you to the first of a four-part lecture series on the choice to believe with Terrell Gibbons, Dr. Terrell Gibbons. The lecture series is organized by the Office of the Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies with the support of 20 academic colleges and other university units. Today's lecture is entitled, The Doors of Faith. We will now have a prayer by Ryan Quaid studying pre-management, after which I will introduce our speaker. Brother Givens will proceed after that. Thank you. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, we approach thee this day and ask that thou wilt fill, fill our souls um, with thy spirit, even the spirit of truth and the spirit of understanding, that we may gain a deeper and better appreciation for our journey here on, um, on earth, our mortal journey, that we may take the light that we learn today and share it with um, the orbits, the human orbits that thou hast placed us in. We say these things humbly in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. I am excited to learn from Dr. Terrell Gibbons today. This past year, I have wrestled with many questions surrounding my faith in the gospel. I knew that others had doubts, but as a returned missionary who was raised in the gospel, I, I didn't want to cause concern or become a project. I had seen how others had reacted to people like me. But you're a returned missionary. But you were raised in the gospel. With all that experience, how could you doubt? So I decided that the best route for my discovery was through personal research. I only found myself to be more confused and more disappointed. I felt I was coming to live a lie. What helped me regain my footing was a quality conversation with an individual here at BYU in whom I trust. He helped me understand that I wasn't alone, that my concerns were valid, and that this was normal. This dear man asked me, Michaela, are you going to choose to believe or are you not going to choose to believe? I chose to believe. I still choose to believe. I still have concerns. I still do not understand many things. But I choose to have the faith that one day I will understand. BYU knows my story is not unique here. We hope that through this lecture series, you will discover that you are not alone that the faculty and staff is invested in helping individually with your faith, and that you will discover the importance of making the choice to believe. No one is better to speak on the subject than Dr. Terrell Givens. He was a visiting Neil A. Maxwell Fellow in the summer of 2017 and 2018. This fellowship sparked his interest in associating with Brigham Young University full-time. This past June, he did just that and became a Neil A. Maxwell Senior Research Fellow. He said, I'm joining a first class group of disciple scholars. The Institute has never been in a better position to succeed in their dual commission to strengthen the saints and to enhance the quality of the conversation academics are having about our faith tradition. I look forward to being a part of both efforts. Before coming to BYU, Dr. Givens held the Jabez A. Boswick Chair of English and was Professor of Literature and Religion at the University of Richmond. He is the author of Wrestling the Angel, The Foundations of Mormon Thought, Feeding the Flock, The Foundations of Mormon Practice, By the Hand of Mormon, The American Scripture That Launched a New World Religion, and other books in the Latter-day Saint Studies. He is also the co-author with his wife Fiona of The God Who Weeps, The Crucible of Doubt, and the Christ who heals. Please enjoy this afternoon. Now, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you for that gracious introduction. 
my presence here is confirmation that miracles can happen. I managed to relocate my wife to Utah. <clears throat> I am grateful for the investment of your time manifest in your attendance here this afternoon. And I'm prayerful that the Spirit will make this a worthwhile hour for all of us. I want to begin with a question. Why are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? The question is not rhetorical, though I'm not asking for your verbal response. But before I proceed further, I want you to have an answer in your own mind. Why are you choosing to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? We are all at various stages in our faith journey. I imagine that if I could overhear your silent responses, they would span the spectrum. Some of you are disciples by inheritance or by inertia. Some because spiritual promptings have brought you to this place. Some of you find yourselves in the valley of decision, weighing the evidence pro and con. And some of you, through grief and heartache, have felt the Savior's embrace and the stirrings of a personal gratitude and a transforming love. Gregory of Nazianzus, a fourth century church father, recreated in his most beautiful sermon a visual account of the Savior's ministry. His reason for following the Christ comes through clearly and poignantly. In his imagined retelling, Jesus teacheth now on a mountain, now he discourseth on a plain, now he passeth over into a ship, and now he rebuketh the surges. And perhaps he goes to sleep in order that he may bless sleep also. Perhaps he weeps that he may make tears blessed. Continuing on, in Gregory, my, Gregory's mind's eye, he sees the Savior as he approaches his earthly suffering. He endureth all things. He putteth up with blows. He bore spittings. He tasted gall. Abruptly, Gregory breaks off at this point in his sermon because he is overcome with a feeling that he is not worthy to put into human language this incomprehensible being and his incomprehensible sacrifice. And pardon me, meanwhile, that I again suffer a human affection. I am filled with grief and indignation for my Christ. And I would that you might sympathize with me when I see my Christ dishonored on this account on which he most merited honor. There is a love of Christ known to mystics and saints. There is a devotion to the Savior that has carried many to their martyrdom. There is a love of Christ that has led one God touched to comfort a solitary woman in her grief and another disciple to reshape the history of civilization. Such a love is transformative and is durable. The incomparable poet Thomas Traherne said this, No man that clearly seeth the beauty of God's face can, when he sees it clearly, willingly and wittingly forsake him. I want to repeat these words because they have become scripture to me. No man that clearly seeth the beauty of God's face can, when he sees it clearly, willingly and wittingly forsake him. And yet, as you all know very well, Everywhere that we turn, men and women are willingly forsaking the beauty of God's face in the world, in Christendom, and among our fellow Latter-day Saints. Many are choosing, in John's words, to walk no more with us. The numbers are heartbreaking. Many and varied are the causes, and all are to be lamented. I want to approach the subject of faith and its loss by assessing just what Traherne might have meant by a willing and witting faith. I believe Traherne is correct, that no one who sees the beauty of God's face can wittingly and willingly forsake him, which must mean 
that too many of us are not fully seen what Traherne saw and loved. Another way of saying this is that our devotion to the savior and healer of the world may be thought of as having two components, a willing heart and a witting mind. I want to link the two concepts together in this way. Anything short of a fervent love for Jesus Christ, any belief structure that is not predicated on a profound and a personal response to him, a living, trusting response is sure to fail us. For it is love, taught the mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, that kindles the will. That is the first test our discipleship must pass, a rootedness in love. Mother Teresa, with keen insight, wrote this. We must become holy, not because we want to feel holy, but because Christ must be able to live his life fully in us. We are to be all love, all faith, all purity for the sake of the poor whom we serve. The problem with institutional religion, even one divinely restored, is the temptation it affords us to make our own spirituality the goal. Rules, standards, commandments, all provide us with the means of measuring our own progress, our own prospects for happiness. That is not discipleship, that is pious self-interest. Little different in motivation from Pascal's infamous wager, and it is a plant that will bear no fruit. But how to develop the kind of love that we seek? The love that has fired the hearts of Christ's most fervent and reliable disciples is not easily acquired. That is why Moroni urges us that we must pray with all the energy of our souls to obtain it. Why, as President Benson urged, we must make faithfulness to his counsel a quest. Why, as King Benjamin observed, we cannot know the master we have not served. Why, as Alma counseled his son, we must learn to place all the affections of the heart upon him. Finally, it is why, as the great Cambridge Platonist John Smith wrote, that which enables us to know and understand aright the things of God must be a living principle of holiness within us. All these are indispensable elements of a love of Christ, which love is the only sure foundation to a durable discipleship. Prayerful seeking, a questing faithfulness, consistent service, disciplined desires, holiness. But they are not my focus at present. Each one deserves a sermon of its own. I want to develop another foundation for a love-based discipleship implied by Traherne's reference to a witting devotion. I want you to think of the times in your life that you learned a deeper truth about a person you knew. Maybe it was a person you loved. But as further aspects of that person's life or goodness or suffering was revealed to you, your love deepened. Do you have such an instance in mind? I served a mission many years ago using money that I had conscientiously saved from a young age, but it ran out before my term of service did. Still, the money kept coming in. Only later did I learn that my mother had taken a job as a custodian, cleaning the local chapel to secure the funds that saw me through my mission. Can you imagine the deepening of my love for a mother willing to quietly and willingly render such kindness to her son. My love was enlarged by my deeper understanding of her love. Now, I am not a saint and I am not a mystic, but I have devoted many years to the study of Joseph Smith's teachings and revelations. And as my comprehension of God's nature and his attributes and his designs for the human family have grown, so have my love for him and for his son. So my remarks today will be my testimony of what I hope is my own witting love for the Savior. By that I mean to suggest that we can come to a greater love of the Lord as we become more aware, more understanding, more reflective, and more informed about just what the restoration of his gospel entails. 
It is more remarkable and more revolutionary than we have perceived. Today and in the three lectures to follow, I will share my conviction that embracing Jesus Christ and his gospel provides us with the most morally compelling, intellectually satisfying, and aesthetically appealing amount, account of the universe and our place in it, and that such a knowledge is a powerful catalyst to love, a witting love of Christ that can endure. To set the stage for what follows, let me begin with what I think is the key to apprehending the purpose and the scope of Restoration Theology. It comes on page 31 of the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. I wanted to pick something you couldn't look up on your smartphone. <laughs> An angel is describing for Nephi the conditions that shall prevail on the earth in the latter days, our days, your day. And this is the phrase that diagnoses in one telling summative image the world you inhabit. The people of the latter days, says the angels, are in that state of awful woundedness. Why are they wounded? Because of the plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb which have been kept back, the angel explains. And what is the promise of healing to come? The Lord God will not suffer that the people shall forever remain in that state. Giving this template for the restoration, we should be endeavoring to recognize, to celebrate, and to assimilate the particular teachings and restored truths that are motivated by our Savior's desire to heal our woundedness, to bind up and to rectify the damage done by the false traditions of the fathers and a secular world hostile to spiritual nurturance. He comes, once his true nature and mission are known, as the healer of our woundedness. In their totality, restoration teachings usher us into a world in which all things are new. Now, what happens when we pass through these doors of faith? Now, according to Luke, the Apostle Paul had opened the doors of faith to the Gentiles. Paul's role in Christian history was to restore covenantal understanding to its primeval intent, an invitation that extended its purview to encompass the entirety of the human family. Jew and Gentile, all are alike unto God. All may come and freely partake. That was the revolution ushered in by Paul. The doors of faith were now open to all. But I'm going to take his words in an almost opposite way of understanding. The words doors of faith in Paul's sense signify a moment when we are all now free to pass through a gate into a new arena. Doors open to let us in normally, but only when something has been disturbed in our own minds are we open to new possibilities coming toward us. In this case, I think the doors that had to be opened were not just the external gates that extended the gospel to a wider audience. They were the closed doors shaped by our own preconceptions. The doors of faith may refer to the world we are now open to. To open the doors of faith is to multiply possibilities, to give all options their due, to reclaim a child's open-eyed delight in a world ever full of surprises that we could not possibly anticipate. It is to find your soul capacious enough, like Enoch's, to swell wide as eternity. That is what is at stake in Restoration Christianity. Our spiritual eyes awaken, our moral faculties expand, our intellect is unfettered, the veil dissipates, and our capacity to live here and now, a more abundant life, opens before us. Now it's my challenge to try to make explicit and substantive those several claims. But the absolute worst thing that we could do in the aftermath of revelations that challenge our faith or shatter our comfortable world is to retreat into an even more protected shelter. It would be as if seeing our outer walls cast down and stormed, we flee to the innermost impregnable tower, which Jean England called that appalling luxury of skepticism. Safe we may be, but the tower that has no windows to let the arrows in 
cannot let the light in either. I will speak in succeeding lectures about the particulars of those plain and precious truths that Joseph restored and that form the basis of a fully aware, witting discipleship. And I will talk about six of them. A father whose vulnerable heart beats in sympathy with ours, sharing our joys but also our pain. And we have a heavenly mother there as well, learning that there is no patriarchal monopoly in heaven. Two, our soul is eternal, coming from a place of glory. Three, life is an educative ascent, not a catastrophic fall. Four, Christ is our healer from woundedness, not our rescuer from depravity. Five, our heavenly parents have the desire and they have the capacity to save and exalt the entire human family, living and dead, past and future. And finally, heaven is a series of relationships we forge, not a place we earn. But that will come in subsequent days. Today, I want to frame these particulars with two guiding principles as foundational to the life of faith. The first is an epistemological claim. It's a claim about how we come to know anything. And the second is more in the way of a philosophical claim about the nature of belief and of choice. Excuse me. First principle. The gospel opens our faculties, intellectual, moral, and sensory, to the richness of a boundless universe. There are multiple ways of knowing, and we need to honor them all. The scientist Werner Heisenberg once stated that what we observe in the universe is not nature itself, but nature exposing itself to our method of questioning. What a brilliant insight. Why is that important? Because it tells us how crucial our questions are. Some questions constrain and limit understanding by their implicit assumptions, and some are generative of insight, empathy, and expansive possibilities. For example, as the astrophysicist Marcello Gleiser elaborates, our view of the world is based only on that fraction of reality we can measure and analyze. Science, as our narrative describing what we see and what we conjecture exists in the natural world, is thus necessarily limited, telling us only part of the story. Faith in something beyond these material realities is so interwoven into our lived experience of the world that we often miss it. In most of life's greatest transactions, where the stakes are the highest, it is to the heart that we rightly turn although not in utter isolation from the rational and reasonable, but whom to marry, what vocation to pursue, when to let go of a dream, what sacrifices to make and promises to keep. These are decisions best made when emotion is moderated but not entirely displaced by logic and rationality alone. And these decisions are certainly made not in the absence of truth, but in recognizing those very truths which logic and science may be powerless to detect. To take one of the most important instances of this fact, we may look to the insight of the East European philosopher William Louis Penn. Louis Penn points out, quote, well, when we must consider love as an attitude by means of which certain aspects of reality become visible. The true meaning of the other as other, the meaning of the other as subject becomes visible only through love. An attitude of preoccupation with ourselves, with our desires and interests, precludes our access to the true meaning of the other." Close quote. This is not just metaphoric language. In the most emphatic and urgent meaning of the word, love reveals truth. It does not create the impression of truth. It does not merely endow something with a subjective truth. Love is the only position or emotional disposition from which we become fully aware of the already present reality of the other person as more than a mere object among other objects in a crowded universe. The philosopher David Hume made his recognition of the limits of rationality alone one of his most controversial but inspired principles. Reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions, he said, and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Now, such a statement is easily taken out of context and ridicule, but Hume's point was simply this, as moral agents immersed in a world of human relationships and human values. 
We most appropriately choose and judge and act as human beings whose desires and motivations and bases for action are deeper than and prior to logic. For example, we read of an instance of child abuse, and we are revolted by such an act of cruelty. It is because it elicits our sense of injustice, our sympathy with the victim, our feeling that something wrong has transpired. If we apply our reason to make sense of the event, notice that it is to forge an argument for what we already know to be true. The intuition of eternal realities precedes its rational articulation. If we find we are unable to express that truth in the language of science or to find logical support for our moral position, that should not blind us to the reality, the truth that child abuse is wrong. In such a case as this, our failure to find support through other faculties should not cause us to doubt our intuitive moral faculty. On the contrary, it should teach us to place greater trust in and value upon it. Conscience has preserved us in our humanity even when other ways of knowing fail. Other truths are experienced and known to us through the instrumentality of great art, great music, great literature. Aesthetic perception is one of the most sublime ways of knowing. That secular prophet Ralph Waldo Emerson, reportedly David O. McKay's favorite writer, said, our music, our poetry, our language itself are not satisfactions, but suggestions. Suggestions of what, I would ask. Ponder the times in your own life that at a moment in Handel's Messiah, looking at Michelangelo's Pietà, or reading Victor Hugo's story of the bishop's candlesticks, you sensed a living reality behind the art greater than the power of any speech to express. My point in all these examples is this. The human impulse toward the sublime and the artist's revelation of the beautiful Love's power to unlock the full splendor of the other, its blinding revelation of the infinite worth of the individual, and conscience with its unwavering response to moral imperatives, its piercing protest against evil, and gentle enticement to recognize the good, all these are living proofs that different ways of knowing exist and are necessary to escape the blinding confines of an epistemology that is limited to the strictly material. We employ them, we rely upon them, and we trust in them as we should. A growing chorus of philosophers and cosmologists, including a substantial number of atheists, are finding the universe at both the macro and micro scale too transcendently magnificent and mysterious for reductive and materialistic approaches. To take one example of the latter, Thomas Nagel comments that the existence of consciousness is both one of the most familiar and one of the most astounding things about the world. No conception of the natural order that does not reveal it as something to be expected, can aspire even to the outline of completeness. And if physical science, whatever it may have to say about the origin of life, leaves us necessarily in the dark about consciousness, that shows it cannot provide even the basic form of intelligibility of this world. Carl Jung imagined a primeval time that he longed for again, when feeling, sensation, intuition, and thought all dwelt in a harmonious synthesis in the human soul. The certainty of love's transformative power, the stunned apprehension before the beautiful, the indelible reality of moral truths that pierce our soul, are these feelings, sensations, and intuitions not avenues to truth as invaluable and as irreplaceable as the rationality that we have come to value above all other faculties? No foundation however logically or rationally appealing, is self-authenticating. Logic can't prove logic. Reason can't prove the validity of reason. And if reason is only evolutionarily derived, then reason itself offers no promise of truth beyond its own immediate functionality. As the theologian Dietrich von Hildebrand noted, the heart has never been given its real place in philosophy. It has never been given a standing comparable to that of the intellect and the will. And here is his interesting observation. He says, this is one of the greatest ironies in philosophy for this reason. The very roots of the Western philosophical tradition count human happiness as the highest good. But human happiness is the domain of the heart, not the rational faculty. So we explicitly place the highest valuation upon a desired outcome, an affect-laden condition, that is beyond the grasp or the achievement of logic or intellect alone. 
And yet, along the path that leads there, we place far more confidence in cool rationality than in that same human heart, with its moral intuitions, its world-transforming compassion and kindness, and its intimations of the sacred. Let me sum up this entire section by quoting from the Book of Mormon, which states with irrefutable wisdom, whatever is light is good, and because it is discernible, it is real. That's the most brilliant course in epistemology ever reduced to one scriptural verse. My second and final point. We are moral agents, and hence belief is a choice. But belief, like life, is difficult by design. There has been no more valuable aid to a diagnosis of the human condition than the story of Eden as clarified in Restoration Scripture. In this, the greatest narrative reconstruction in Christian thought, we encounter two remarkable texts in the Book of Mormon and the Book of Moses that reveal the poignant truth about our predicament, the most valuable insights into the pained and wounded nature of our lives here. Eve and Adam discover that the primeval conflict at the heart of our existence as moral agents is that we find ourselves in a universe where we are not primarily embroiled in a titanic struggle between good and evil. We find ourselves in a perpetual, more immersive, and more quotidian confrontation with competing, often irreconcilable, goods. Centuries of preachers and theologians trace the story of our race to a simplistic dichotomy Obey or disobey, God or the devil, submission or rebellion. Choosing wrongly, we are all now vessels of sin looking for redemption. I'm surprised it took 2,000 years for Christianity to lose its mass appeal and begin its steady decline in the West. <laughs> but we find in 2 Nephi and the Book of Moses alike an utterly new version of this story that launches this educative ascent toward godliness that we call mortality. For here in the narrative of Eden, we find two terribly compelling options. Yes, obedience and safety and security in God's presence are presented as one of the choices. But the restoration narratives are more sympathetic to Eve's perception of the alternative, the beauty of the fruit, its goodness as food, its desirability to make one wise. How have we missed this convergence in her mind of the sacred triad of the good, the true, and the beautiful? as acting upon her with a legitimate appeal fully equal to the alternative. In this, the foundational mythos of human life in a new plane of existence, the fundamental position in which we find ourselves is to face front and center, not a blatant choice between good and evil, but a wrenching decision to be made between competing sets of good. The philosopher Hegel believed that this scenario replicated in myriad artistic narratives expressed the inescapably tragic nature of the universe. There are very few simple choices. No blueprint gives us easy answers. Life's most wrenching choices are not between right and wrong, but between competing demands on our time, our resources, our love, and our loyalty, and our faith. We inhabit a perpetual ground of tension, and that is central to God's purposes for us. We must absorb the lesson of Eden, or our lives will be lived in perpetual dismay. I'm reminded of something that C.S. Lewis wrote in the midst of World War II, which conflict fell with particular brutality on the people of his homeland. He said, war creates no absolutely new situation. It simply aggravates the permanent human situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. The permanent human situation is that life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. This is not a cosmic accident or the fruit of primordial misdeeds. Life is difficult by design, as my son likes to say. A crucial precept for engaging in life soberly, but also joyfully. Listen to a remarkable piece of wisdom from Lehi's blessing to his son Jacob. And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created. I find it utterly incredible 
that for Lehi, the fate worse than death, the condition that he deplores as an unthinkable option, is perfect equilibrium, stasis. This revisionist account of Eden celebrates our immersion in pain, difficulty, struggle, and variety of experience. The alternative would be a compound in one of all things, a condition of no life, neither death, meaningless sameness. That is the condition for which opposition in all things is the foil and the rescue. But as I conclude my remarks today, I want to nudge you toward the recognition of one kind of precipice, one condition of cognitive dissonance in particular. For the choice in Eden between two competing alternatives that were equally appealing is a template, a pattern. For the most momentous choice you will all face today and recurrently in the future, and that is the choice to believe. Those of you who have lived among the saints at home or in your communities all know one peculiarity of the Latter-day Saints, and that is the cultural rhetoric of certainty. Every month we hear speaker after speaker testify of truths they know to be true. Now please do not misunderstand what I am about to say. To some is given, in the words of Scripture, to know that Jesus is the Christ, that this is his restored gospel. One of the most glorious promises in this new dispensation is that every soul, every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am every soul, eventually. But certainly the Spirit blows where it lists, and you may be one to whom that gift has not been bestowed. Or you may be one whose certainties of today become your questions of tomorrow. What I say now, I am saying to you who are here today in particular. Please recognize that the Lord refers to the capacity to believe without knowing as a gift as well. And in my mind, it's the greater gift. And here's why. As I have said in another setting many years ago, the call to faith is a summons to engage the heart to attune it to resonate in sympathy with principles and values and ideals that we devoutly hope are true and have reasonable but not certain grounds for believing to be true. I am convinced that there must be grounds for doubt as well as belief in order to render the choice more truly a choice and therefore the more deliberate and laden with personal vulnerability and investment. The option to believe must appear on one's personal horizon like the fruit of paradise, perched precariously between sets of demands held in dynamic tension. One is, I believe, always provided with sufficient materials out of which to fashion a life of credible conviction or dismissive denial. We are acted upon, in other words, by appeals to our personal values, our yearnings, our fears, our appetites, and our ego. What we choose to embrace and to be responsive to is the purest reflection of who we are and what we love. That is why faith, the choice to believe, is in the final analysis an action that is positively laden with moral significance. And confronted with what seem equally compelling alternatives, remember that there is something to predispose us to a life of faith or a life of unbelief. And that is the heart, that in these conditions of equilibrium and balance, and only in these conditions, equally enticed by the one or the other, is truly free to choose belief or cynicism, faith or faithlessness. Why then is there more value given this perfect balance in believing in the Christ and his gospel and his prophets than in believing in a false deity or nothing at all? Perhaps because there is nothing in the universe or any possible universe more perfectly good, absolutely beautiful, worthy of adoration and worthy of emulation than this Christ. And a gesture of belief in that direction, a will manifesting itself as a desire to acknowledge his virtues as the paramount virtues of a divided universe is a response to the best in us, the best and noblest of which the human soul is capable. To conclude, 
I plead with you to trust those subtle intimations you find from whatever waters at which you drink, as the language of spirit speaking to spirit. I pray you will have the stubborn feistiness of a John Keats. Like so many of his age, the poet Keats was disheartened by institutionalized systems of religion that had almost universally emphasized depravity and guilt while doing more to justify suffering than alleviate it. But something would not let him give in to despair, as he wrote hopefully to his dying brother. Yet through all this, I see Christ's splendor. Even here, I myself am pursuing the same instinctive course as the various human animal you can think of. I am, however, however young, straining at particles of light in the midst of a great darkness. He continued that while unsure of his own conclusions, he was confident that a superior being could not but be pleased with the struggle he put forth to make sense of it all, so at least he pled, whether to God or to his brother, we are not sure. Give me this credit. Do you not think I strive to know? Give me this credit. So my friends, please know this, that God gave you your agency and he made you free. And I pray that you will awaken to the beauty of a faith freely ventured and freely given. And that with time, you will come to see the beauty of God's face if you have not already, and never willingly nor wittingly forsake it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.